I'm really delighted to uh, be here this afternoon to have a chance to talk to you. And as I thought about uh, this talk, I was thinking, so what could a cardiovascular geneticist or someone who's been very broadly interested in uh, human genetics have to say of use to uh, uh, an autism community or people who are interested in disease uh, uh, autism? And in a lot of ways, uh, my career has been uh, following a parallel path to uh, uh, what the Simons Foundation has been doing in autism. And so uh, I'll try to give that perspective today rather than talking about a diversity of projects. Uh, so when we think about our goals in biomedical investigation, many of them are that uh, uh, the basic idea that if you understand basic biology of health and disease, these will provide key insights into uh, normal and disease biology. And when you understand uh, disease biology, those are the best opportunities to think about uh, ways to prevent disease, ways to diagnose it, and ultimately new ways to treat it appropriately. Genetics is a fantastic way to approach diseases that have not fallen to other approaches of epidemiology, cell biology, and biochemistry. So when I was a graduate student, uh, the, the idea of positional cloning had, uh, uh, was invented in the lab I was a graduate student in, uh, Dave Hogness. And the first positional cloning project was the positional cloning of the gene for bithorax. It was just the first developmental gene uh, identified, and it was a gene that uh, grossly transformed one body segment of a fly into a different body segment. And the idea that a single mutation could have such a profound impact on all of development I thought was just a remarkable uh, discovery. And that then inspired me to uh, pursue uh, applying these same technologies to trying to understand uh, heretofore poorly understood human diseases. And so we've been through three eras of uh, gene discovery over the last uh, 25 years or so, and they've each been driven by saltatory changes in technology. And the first of these was the development of dense genetic maps of the human genome, where we could develop polymorphisms that allowed us to distinguish the two copies of every segment of every human chromosome and follow those through families, and thereby use this tool of positional cloning, just based on the chromosomal position that we have mapped by following the segregation of specific segments of chromosomes and comparing it to the inheritance of Mendelian traits uh, segregating in humans. That was followed by the development of extremely dense and very inexpensive SNP genotyping that allow us to genotype common variations and compare them to uh, the prevalence of uh, various diseases in large cohorts of patients. So the difference is in the first, you're looking at specific families segregating typically rare phenotypes and uh, doing positional cloning from the map location. In the second, you're taking large cohorts of patients now in the hundreds of thousands of individuals and, f and com looking for common variants that are associated with disease. The difference in what you get from these two approaches is one gives you rare mutations with large effect, the second gives you uh, common variants that have small effect, and these have quite different impact on our understanding of biology and our ability to uh, make uh, uh, prognostic uh, uh, predictions about uh, risk of disease, and I'll return to that. But these have now been uh, supplanted to a large extent uh, by the dramatic reduction in the cost of DNA sequencing that now let us uh, sequence very large numbers of individuals looking for rare mutations with large effect on disease risk, eliminating the need for these uh, uh, well phenotyped extended pedigrees uh, that were so useful in the positional cloning uh, era. So I want to make a pitch for rare mutations with large effect. Uh, even though they may explain only a fraction of uh, disease causation. The importance of these is that they give you new biology. They establish a causal link between a genotype on one hand and a phenotype on the other, and that's a profound, has profound impact for how do you, you can go from understanding the genotype and then filling in the gap. What is the biology that connects the genotype to the phenotype? And when you understand that, that gives you clear insight into disease causation. Also importantly, rare mutations with large effect can give you a very good idea for what genes and pathways you might manipulate for health benefit, uh, not just in the patients with these rare diseases, but for patients who have common forms uh, of those same uh, disorders. The, importantly, these rare alleles tell you both 
the direction that you'll get from, uh, a drug, for example, a drug, but also the magnitude of the effect that you might be able to achieve. So for example, if you have a homozygous loss of function mutation that impacts a trait, that will give you a good idea. If I had a, a good proxy, if I had a drug that uh, completely knocked down the uh, impact of that protein, what's the biggest impact that I could get? And as importantly, would there be any adverse effects that I would want to be sure to avoid? So you might have a drug that had great effect to uh, uh, mitigate the effects of autism, uh, but if you found that that uh, knockout had uh, extensive phenotypic abnormalities in other organs, you might think twice about uh, using that drug uh, and the efficacy of it. So the disease that I chose to work on uh, starting out uh, when I started my own laboratory was hypertension. And hypertension uh, I picked simply because it's a major public health problem worldwide and nobody had the faintest idea of what its cause was. It affects more than a billion people around the world. Uh, it's the leading cause of global death. It contributes to seven million deaths a year from heart attack, five million deaths a year from stroke, uh, and per the World Health Organization, it's the single largest uh, cause of death on the planet. Uh, and its pathogenesis has largely been unknown. So this just shows some basic statistics about uh, hypertension. For every 15 millimeter increase in uh, usual diastolic uh, blood pressure, there's a fourfold increase in the risk of stroke for common disease, that's a huge effect, and a twofold increase in the risk of heart disease. And these are not just associated with the disease. If you lower blood pressure, you mitigate the risk of these diseases. And most of our single agent drugs have tiny effects on blood pressure. And this shows the results of the All Hat study, a 47,000 patient uh, outcome study that showed after just five years of treatment with a single agent uh, with an average blood pressure reduction of five millimeters of mercury, pretty small potatoes, it reduced stroke 38% and reduced heart attack 16%. But most of these patients are not getting anywhere near what we would consider to be optimal therapy. So what is the cause of blood pressure? Well, this is a working model for the regulation of blood pressure devised by Arthur Guyton in 1970, uh, when we knew about a third of the elements that we now recognize that uh, are involved in the art uh, regulation of arterial blood pressure. And I think you'll concede that this is a pretty complex wiring diagram. And as a consequence, hypertension has been variously and hotly debated to be a primary disease of the brain, of the heart, of the kidney, of the adrenal gland, of the liver, and of the vasculature. And this poses the question of, if we don't know what organ we ought to be treating to try to understand the disease, we're in pretty rough shape trying to come up with anything like uh, optimal therapy. But this looked to me, starting out, as a great opportunity to try to apply human genetics. And I thought this looked just like Dave Hogness with his developmental mutants in the fly. And we thought, where can you introduce a single mutation in this system that would completely disrupt the behavior of the entire system? And I was a young assistant professor just getting started at the time, and uh, you know, all of my elders in the field would give me a gentle pat on the back and say, good luck with that, buddy. You, if you just look at this diagram, you can see. It is so complicated that if you have a lesion at any one spot, you will always get feedback uh, compensation from other sites, and there's no way you will have any single mutation that will have a large effect on the trait. But of course, this completely, you could have said exactly the same thing about developmental biology. Development is so complicated, you will never have a single mutation uh, that has large effect. So I thought I was on pretty good ground in trying to uh, pursue this problem uh, and thought uh, I also was in pretty good shape because nobody else was going to take this problem on and I'll have the field of myself uh, getting started. So we set out to uh, scour the planet looking for individuals with the very highest and very lowest blood pressures that are compatible with survival. Uh, and when we found these uh, severely affected individuals, we collected their extended pedigrees, looking for traits that mendelize, where either a recessive trait that uh, recurs uh, in one in four offspring from the same parents, uh, or that are dominant and uh, half of the offspring of an affected individual uh, get the trait themselves. 
So these pedigrees look uh, like this. These are a couple of pedigrees that we uh, collected. Uh, the one on the bottom uh, is actually a recessive pedigree from a village in, uh, uh, in Saudi Arabia that we collected where all of the offspring uh, are the product of consanguineous union that date back to uh, a common founder uh, and clear evidence that this was going to turn out to be a recessive disease. And we found the disease gene from studying just this one family. So at that time, at the start, we collect these extended families, uh, genotype markers, informative uh, polymorphic markers across all, uh, the entire genome, and look for segments of chromosomes that co-segregated uh, with the disease. And this, of course, has been supplanted over the years by uh, uh, new approaches such as uh, exome sequencing. So we developed exome sequencing uh, in two th and, and did the first uh, application of it in 2009. Uh, and this is Muram Choi and John Overton who developed uh, the technology in uh, my lab in collaboration with a company called Nimblegen. And uh, John is now uh, leading the sequencing of the autism uh, uh, cohort for the Simons uh, collaboration at uh, Regeneron, where he set up and runs uh, their pipeline. Uh, this has been a transformative technology from the standpoint that uh, uh, at a time, it's, it's always run between five and tenfold less than genome sequencing. It allows us to sequence just the 1% of the genome that encodes the 20,000 genes in uh, the human genome. And this can be done uh, much less ex uh, at much less cost than whole genome sequencing. And this is where most of the information lies in uh, Mendelian genetics. And the total cost for sequencing an, uh, an exome uh, today at, uh, in our lab at Yale or at Regeneron is about $200. So you can do a lot of experiments. And this turns out to be important for new disease uh, gene discovery. So this was the first uh, application of exome sequencing. We used it to make a clinical diagnosis in 2009. Jay Shinduri at the uh, University of Washington at almost the same time discovered a new disease gene uh, using this uh, technology and uh, everyone was off to the races. So using these rare families and using uh, uh, exome sequencing over the years, we have collected a pretty good list of genes that drive blood pressure to the very highest end of the uh, uh, distribution and, on the other hand, drive blood pressure to the very lowest end of the blood pressure distribution. And I would assert that this looks a lot like the list of genes that have been discovered that uh, cause autism, that have rare mutations with large effect. And so what's happened in the case of these genes that, have high, that cause high and low blood pressure uh, compared to uh, what's happened to date with uh, autism? Well, we benefit enormously in uh, this field in having extremely good physiology that predated uh, our genetic work and also a lot of work that uh, we and others have done subsequently to go from just having rand seemingly random gene lists to figuring out what physiologic pathways are being regulated by this, uh, these lists of high and low blood pressure genes. And I'll start by pointing out that these two lists are not different from one another in their entirety. In fact, there are five genes that show up on both the high blood pressure list and the low blood pressure list. And uh, this gives you a clue that uh, something interesting is going on, that for five of these genes, you can have one form of mutation that drives blood pressure to the highest levels compatible with survival and other mutations in the same gene that drive blood pressure to the opposite extreme. So variation in the activity of a single gene can drive blood pressure across the entire spectrum seen in the seven billion people on the planet. That seems like an important idea. Yes. So, so I'll... I'll you're, you're, you're Jim always jumping to the conclusion, right? So it turns out, uh, to Jim's point, that all of the mutations, uh, virtually all of the mutations on this side, with w the exception of one gene, are all gain-of-function mutations that are autosomal dominant in transmission, and uh, all of the genes on this side are loss-of-function mutations, and these five genes that uh, uh, go in both directions, gain-of-function here, loss-of-function here. So gain-of-function drives blood pressure to the highest levels, loss-of-function to the lowest levels. So I'll show you, uh, so the, then the question, of course, is which physiologic pathways are implicated uh, in these genes? Are they distributed across the physiologic landscape, 
or do they converge into uh, particular pathways? And this, of course, is the key question, uh, I think, for autism, and an, un an unanswered question uh, at this point. But I think this is a good example where getting these lists, figuring out the biology, has given you profound insights into the biology underlying the disease. So I'll introduce you to the answer to the story, and this is a nephron in the kidney. So our kidneys have a million of these nephrons, and every day they filter about uh, one and a half kilos of salt and have to reabsorb all but about 1% of the filtered load, which is what we're taking in uh, uh, orally on a daily basis. And this works by a series of ion exchangers, transporters, and channels. Uh, that in turn are regulated by a hormonal system called the renin-angiotensin system. Uh, this is, angiotensinogen is a circulating protein that uh, when the body becomes volume depleted, the kidney secretes a hormone, a, an aspartyl protease called renin, that cleaves angiotensinogen, which is further processed by an enzyme called angiotensin-converting enzyme, to the active hormone angiotensin II which uh, binds to a receptor in the adrenal gland uh, to promote the production of the steroid hormone aldosterone. And aldosterone binds to its uh, receptor in these cells and these cells in the kidney to increase sodium and chloride uh, reabsorption. This is electro-neutral. This is uh, electrogenic, so sodium reabsorption provides the electrical driving force to support the secretion of potassium and hydrogen ion, and that turns out to be important uh, in uh, understanding some of the abnormalities that we see uh, in patients with uh, high blood pressure. So taking you through some of these uh, uh, genes that underlie extreme forms of high blood pressure, the first gene we discovered was an unusual mutation that caused constitutive production of this steroid hormone that tells the kidney to hang on to uh, uh, more salt. And the mutation turns out to be an unusual gene fusion that's, uh, that, fuses, that creates a new gene that is not present in normal individuals. So these two genes, the final step for aldosterone biosynthesis and a related enzyme that's involved in the biosynthesis of cortisol, another steroid hormone, these two genes recently evolved from a common ancestor. They lie right next to one another on the chromosome, and they can occasionally recombine with one another. And when they do, one of the progeny chromosomes, instead of two chromosomes, contains three. So if you follow the crossover, you see that you have a normal copy here, a normal copy here, and then interposed a gene that fuses what turns out to be regulatory sequences from this gene onto coding sequences from this gene. And the consequence of that is that uh, this hormone aldosterone synthase, or this enzymatic activity, is transferred from the adrenal glomerulosa, where it's normally made, to the adrenal fasciculata, where cortisol is normally made. So at the expense of maintaining normal cortisol levels, these patients are all the time making aldosterone. And as a consequence, they hang on to, salt, uh, to increase salt, Water follows to maintain the serum sodium concentration at about 140 millimolar. That varies very little from individual to individual under normal circumstances. Uh, and as a consequence, these patients get uh, increased plasma volume initially. Expanded plasma volume leads to increased cardiac output, and by Ohm's law, blood pressure goes up. So this was the first gene for uh, hypertension uh, identified uh, by this process. Just downstream of aldosterone is its receptor, the mineralocorticoid receptor. Uh, and David Geller, shown here uh, in the lab, discovered uh, a mutation in the mineralocorticoid receptor in another of these rare families segregating a, a rare mutation with very large effect that mapped to the location of the mineralocorticoid receptor. Uh, and uh, we showed that the mutation lies in the ligand binding domain and the late Paul Sigler uh, uh, and our lab uh, figured out how that works, uh, at least a speculative model, which David then proved uh, biochemically is true. So the wild type uh, receptor has serine at this position and the mutant has a leucine at this position. And it turns out that uh, this, with a serine at this position, for aldosterone, shown here, to bind to the ligand binding domain, it needs a 21-hydroxyl group, which interacts with helix-3 of the receptor. In the presence of this mutation, 
you get this binding effect from the leucine uh, to helix 3, and that eliminates the requirement for a 21-hydroxyl group. And as a consequence, steroids that don't have this 21-hydroxyl group can nonetheless activate uh, this receptor. And one of those uh, steroid hormones is progesterone. And when women who harbor this mutation get pregnant and their progesterone levels uh, rise dramatically, they develop rip-roaring pregnancy-induced hypertension and all require pre uh, early delivery because of life-threatening uh, hypertension. So just downstream from that receptor is its target, the epithelial sodium channel. And we also identified families that are segregating gain-of-function mutations in the epithelial sodium channel. So this channel has three subunits, and each of the subunits has a sequence in its uh, as, as carboxy terminus that uh, is, encodes the signal for uh, inclusion and capture in clathrin-coated pits and clearance from the cell surface. So the mutations that cause this uh, Mendelian form of high blood pressure uh, chop off or modify uh, these amino acids in the tail that get it included in clathrin-coated pits. And in the presence of these mutations, these channels survive on the cell surface in an abnormal fashion. They remain uh, active and enter into the same final common pathway of increasing uh, sodium reabsorption leading to uh, high blood pressure. On the other side of the coin, looking for individuals who have extremely low blood pressure in the population, this is Su Chang who discovered uh, the first of these mutations, which are in fact loss of function mutations, and these are recessive diseases, so both chromosomes carry loss of function mutations in the same sodium channel in which we had gain of function mutations that cause high blood pressure. And so in this case, they, they can't hang on to salt and water properly. They have salt wasting. They activate the renin angiotensin system. Uh, but uh, that fails to augment sodium reabsorption through this channel. And these children have profoundly uh, severe uh, hypotension. They need to eat 25 to 30 grams of salt a day just to be able to maintain a blood pressure to stay conscious when they stand up. So, uh, and that, of course, tells you we used to say that this sodium channel doesn't do very much. It only reabsorbs 2% of the filtered load. It turns out to be one of the rate, final rate-limiting uh, uh, processes that uh, you just can't do without because there's not a good way to compensate uh, for its loss. Upstream from that is an interesting pharmacologic target. Loss of function mutations in this uh, sodium chloride co-transporter uh, cause a mild form of uh, low blood pressure called Gittleman syndrome. Uh, and in this case, these children can compensate for the loss of this by activating the renin angiotensin system and increase their sodium uh, reabsorption because they have high aldosterone levels. But that occurs at the expense of secreting more potassium and hydrogen, uh, resulting in low serum potassium level uh, and uh, metabolic alkalosis, which causes biochemical problems uh, for these uh, individuals. And then upstream from that, is uh, the, uh, uh, the thick ascending limb of Henle, which is the uh, nephron segment preceding it uh, here, where 30% of the filtered load is reabsorbed. And we have uh, mutations in uh, now four different genes that cause a severe defect in uh, salt reabsorption uh, uh, in the kidney. So starting with a blank slate, uh, we've uh, been able to fill this in uh, pretty well, and there are uh, four main cell types in which uh, mutations have large effects to uh, modulate uh, blood pressure uh, in humans. And as I've uh, outlined, uh, these mutations have really profound effects on blood pressure. They average about 30 millimeters uh, mercury effect uh, on blood pressure. So if you were otherwise going to have uh, a normal blood pressure of uh, uh, 130 over 70, uh, your blood pressure instead would be uh, uh, you know, 160 over 100, uh, but typically much more severe than that uh, at various times of life. These children uh, and adults all come to uh, clinical attention very early in life. Uh, and many of the families report uh, these profound histories of uh, stroke at early ages, often from cerebral hemorrhage, uh, or th on the other side, with low blood pressure, they simply uh, uh, don't survive because they can't maintain a blood pressure. 
So I think it's a very nice uh, uh, demonstration of the general point that uh, starting with a blank slate, find a bunch of genes, figure out what pathways they fall into, uh, and uh, you un start suddenly begin to get insight into the pathogenesis uh, of the disease. I made the point that uh, five of the genes are loss of function at one end, gain of function in the same genes at the other end of the distribution, giving you uh, pretty good confidence that uh, if you modulate the uh, uh, activity of this pathway, you will have an important effect on uh, uh, blood pressure. You can do interesting things once you understand uh, a little bit about the uh, biology. And one of these is you can go out and study families and look at their uh, physiology. Uh, and this is Fiona Carrot, who is uh, now a professor at the uh, University of Cambridge, and Dina Cruz, who is now at University of California, San Diego. And they studied uh, this family with uh, uh, 200 individuals who were segregating a uh, mutation for Gittleman syndrome, the sodium chloride co-transporter. This is the target for the most commonly used uh, antihypertensive worldwide, thiazide diuretics. And they asked very simple questions like what is, what's their blood pressure, but they also asked more interesting questions like how much salt do these individuals eat on a daily basis? So these people uh, are, know that they are, uh, have some abnormalities, but they're not typically, they t when we studied them, they did not typically know uh, that they had a clinical diagnosis, uh, but they had self-selected their own diets. And so we did something quite simple, which is just measure what is their 24-hour urinary uh, sodium output, which at steady state, ref what you're taking in is, uh, equals what you're uh, putting out. And we measured this on several occasions in each individual. It was pretty consistent. And so if you look at their urinary sodium uh, 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 excretion, uh, compared to their wild-type brothers and sisters, if you had two mutant copies of the gene, you were eating a lot more salt. And if you were, but even if, you were eating only, even if you had only one mutant copy of the gene, you were still eating uh, sub uh, dramatically more salt than your wild-type brothers and sisters. And this was not a subtle effect. When you ask these people about their dietary habits, for example, what's your favorite beverage? Many of them would say, pickle juice. <laughs> How about you? <laughs> and you say, what, you know, what is their, uh, what's your favorite dessert? Oh, ice cream with salt on it. And uh, several of them had, uh, many of them had special beverages that they had concocted that turned out to be not just sodium, but potassium rich uh, uh, as well. Um, so they had found ways to compensate for uh, their abnormality. Uh, they have a primary salt wasting problem and they're compensating by eating more salt. And it turns out this is attributable to the activation of the renin angiotensin system. And angiotensin II uh, is informing the brain to go out and eat eat more salt uh, through uh, uh, I its uh, regulation. Um, and this, of course, has an important clinical implication. So what happens when we give a patient uh, a thiazide diuretic in the clinic to treat their hypertension? We give them the drug, tell them it's going to make them pee a little more, give them a gentle pat on the back and say, by the way, don't, don't eat too much salt. Well, what these, these guys are the proof of exactly what the problem is with that approach. You give a patient a thiazide diuretic, they start wasting salt, and they immediately start driving the compensatory mechanism, eat more salt. You're not going to get very far with your treatment uh, if you don't blunt uh, the regulatory response to the problem. And so that's exactly what uh, uh, these patients suggested, is that rather than simply treating with a single thiazide uh, agent, the optimal combination would be to give them a thiazide diuretic and an ACE inhibitor in combination that blunts the renin angiotensin system uh, response to uh, the defect. And that now is uh, the most commonly used antihypertensive uh, medical uh, combination, and it's highly efficacious. And instead of getting blood pressure down by five millimeters mercury, we can get blood pressure down by about 20 millimeters of mercury in many patients. A second thing you can do once you have mutations identified, you can ask interesting questions about, well, I know that these kids with uh, two mutant copies of a gene are severely affected, but we have an indication that the people who have only one mutant copy have an, uh, have an, uh, an effect, uh, it's just not as clinically noticeable. So we went out in the Framingham uh, uh, Heart Study cohort and sequenced all individuals uh, for three of these genes uh, with, uh, in which two mutant copies of the gene cause low blood pressure. 
And what we found was about what we expected, about 2% of the population is walking around with one mutant copy of the gene. And so we were able to ask, because this is a longitudinal study, what's the consequence over the lifespan of having one mutant copy of the gene compared to everybody else in the cohort who is wild type for, for those uh, three genes? And it turns out that age 25, age 50, and age 60, uh, there's a significant reduction in blood pressure in the carriers compared to the non-carriers. And uh, it's about a 10 millimeter mercury effect at age 60, which is, about the, which is larger than the average effect that you get from a single antihypertensive uh, agent. So not surprisingly, these patients uh, generally were, had about a two-thirds reduction in the diagnosis of hypertension by the age of 60. So we also wondered, what is, is there clinical outcome uh, impact of that? And the part that's interesting is that these people have had this low blood pressure trait their entire life, rather than at age 50, somebody putting them on an antihypertensive drug. And so we asked, what's the incidence of uh, cardiovascular death and stroke in these individuals compared to the rest of the Framingham cohort? And the answer is, it's pretty good. There has not been a single death from cardiovascular disease or stroke, uh, incidence of stroke in these individuals uh, uh, in this uh, study. So this tells us that uh, the earlier you start, the better. We get uh, similar uh, imp indication along these lines uh, from the study of cholesterol. Patients who have inherited low cholesterol do much better than patients who have simply started taking a statin uh, uh, at age uh, 50 or 60. Uh, so it's challenging to think about how we're going to develop uh, drugs where uh, you do clinical outcomes, where you start somebody on uh, antihypertensive or low cholesterol therapy at age 30 and wait until they're 70 to see whether they uh, have improved or not. Uh, but these kinds of natural history studies, I think, are quite informative. So uh, people have uh, modeled what would, what would be the impact of, uh, so, so now we have a good, gene, a good genetics and we have an environmental component. Salt is the environmental component. Um, and uh, empirical studies as well as uh, uh, modeling studies suggest that you can lower blood pressure substantially by even modest reductions in dietary uh, salt intake. And I'll show some of that data in a moment. Uh, so Lee uh, Goldman and, con uh, and uh, 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 colleagues have uh, estimated that uh, simply reducing uh, dietary salt intake uh, by 25%, we eat on average uh, about 9 grams of salt a day. It's not uh, a big reduction to get down 25%. Uh, uh, we get most of that from uh, processed foods and uh, uh, eating out on a, a daily basis. Uh, so the estimate is that uh, reducing uh, dietary salt intake by about 25% would reduce the number of strokes per year by 50,000 in the U.S., the number of heart attacks by about 75,000, all-cause deaths uh, by about 70,000, and reduction in health care cost uh, would be very substantial. This has been picked up by uh, the Institute of Medicine, now the National Academy of Medicine, uh, and the FDA. Uh, and here's a quote from the Center for Disease Control. Hands down, blood pressure control is the most important thing you can do in healthcare. We can tri trigger efforts that will save 100 million lives, only focusing on sodium reduction, trans fats, and blood pressure control. I'll say that uh, this has come a long way when I submitted my first uh, uh, NIH grant proposing to find these rare mutations with large effect on blood pressure. I got a score that uh, no one in this room will ever get again uh, because uh, now we triage uh, grants in the lower half. But you used to get the full range and uh, my, gr my first grant on this topic got a score of five. The meaning of a score of five is that if you had an infinite amount of money and no other applicants under no circumstances should you fund this grant. <laughs> so, so we also have solved some new problems with uh, uh, the exome sequencing that has gotten us into new territory that I want to tell you a little bit about. So one of these is that this hormone aldosterone, as I've pointed out, has an interesting dual effect. Uh, in the setting of volume depletion, it promotes increased salt reabsorption, but this same hormone is used in the setting of high serum potassium to tell the kidney to increase salt uh, potassium secretion. So the question is, when the kidney sees aldosterone, how does it know whether it ought to be maximizing salt reabsorption or maximizing potassium secretion? 
And uh, this turns out, if you read the, f the textbooks of physiology, uh, historically, they've been embarrassingly quiet on this point, but when really pushed, they'll say, well, it just kind of works out, and they can give you some hand-waving as to why that is. Uh, but it looked to us like we were probably missing an important piece of physiology, and the reason for being sure that that was the case is it turns out that there are patients who behave as though they can only use aldosterone in this part of the loop. They can only use aldosterone to promote salt reabsorption and can't use it to promote potassium secretion and as a consequence have high blood pressure from the salt reabsorption and high potassium that is frequently life-threatening because they can't secrete it. And so we set out to find those genes. And uh, Rick Wilson, who is a graduate student in the lab and is now a faculty member at, uh, at Yale, identified a novel family of serine threonine kinases called the Wink kinases. And at the time he discovered them, we had absolutely no idea what they did, except that mutations in them, and in particular I'll point to point mutations in Wink 4, caused this uh, phenotype of high blood pressure and high serum potassium levels. So we went on and figured out uh, something about the physiology of uh, these. Maria Laliati made terrific animal models. Uh, Chris Colley did uh, uh, some cell-based work. Uh, he's now a faculty member at, at Yale. Uh, Maria is uh, at Biogen. And uh, Aaron Ring uh, was an undergraduate in the lab who also did important work on this project. And he's now a faculty member at Yale in uh, immunobiology. Chris Colley, I think, gave a talk here at uh, the last uh, symposium a couple of weeks ago uh, on the work he's currently doing. So we learned a lot about uh, that the winks were regulating the activity of the thiazide-sensitive co-transporter, and the pathway was identified that phosphorylation of a, a protein called SPAC led to phosphorylation of the sodium chloride co-transporter. It also regulates the epithelial sodium channel. It regulates the potassium channel required for potassium secretion. So we learned a bit about that. But we didn't understand uh, what was regulating WINK4, and we also didn't understand eight and about 90% of the families with this phenotype of hypertension and hyperkalemia, and it wasn't until exome sequencing came along uh, that we uh, figured that out. But relevant to uh, autism, perhaps, there were a couple of other things we figured out about uh, uh, the WINK kinases. And one of them is they play an important role in the regulation both of cell volume and also of uh, response to uh, uh, GABA in ionotropic uh, GABA receptors. So it turns out that the WINK kinases are chloride sensors, di direct chloride sensors, and in the setting of, uh, uh, and, and, and intracellular chloride is regulated by uptake through proteins that transport sodium, potassium, and chloride, and, and chloride exit by KCL co-transport. So they use the favorable uh, chemical gradient for sodium uptake and potassium exit uh, to drag chloride along with it, uh, with or against its electrochemical gradient. And so the activity of uh, uh, this is regulated uh, positively by the Wnt kinases and negatively by the Wnt kinases here. So that uh, in the, if, uh, if you have this active and this uh, inactive, intracellular chloride levels go up, uh, and uh, that leads to a counter-regulatory mechanism that leads to uh, uh, removal of the phosphates that make this inactive and this active. Uh, and this goes back and forth, and this is how cells uh, regulate, uh, like red cells, regulate cell volume. In uh, neurons uh, expressing uh, ionotropic GABA receptors, uh, uh, the same mechanism is working uh, by different uh, uh, version, uh, different isoforms of uh, the three-ion co-transporter and KCL co-transporters. But in this case, intracellular chloride levels uh, determine whether GABA is excitatory, as it is if chloride levels are high. Uh, you open up this GABA opens up the chloride channel. Chloride comes out, reducing, uh, uh, reducing the electrochemical uh, membrane potential uh, and promoting excitation. On the other hand, uh, uh, it inhibits uh, if uh, you have uh, uh, chloride levels low in the cell. And this is Jesse Reinhardt uh, who uh, figured this out, and he too is uh, now in, this, in the uh, uh, physiology department uh, at Yale. And so Jesse figured out 
that the wink kinases are phosphorylating uh, two sites in the cytoplasmic tails of uh, the KCL co-transporters, uh, such that uh, in the presence of, uh, if these are threonines, uh, you're able to uh, phosphorylate uh, uh, them. Uh, and uh, the, uh, ki the transporter is inactive. Uh, this is uh, uptake in uh, cells uh, of rubidium, which uh, behaves like uh, uh, potassium in, uh, in this uh, uh, assay. And if you mutate these two sites, uh, the KCL co-transporters become uh, extremely active. Uh, and this turns out, as I said, to be regulating cell volume. This turns out to be quite interesting because this pathway has potential uh, interest uh, for regulating uh, excitation and uh, inhibition in the nervous system. But getting back to uh, the other families with this uh, trait, uh, once exome sequencing came along, we realized why we had not figured out 90% of the families with hypertension and hyperkalemia. This is Lynn Boyden, who is a graduate student uh, in the laboratory who showed that uh, one of the genes is Cullen-3, which is a component of a ubiquitin ligase, and all of the patients with mutations in Cullen-3 have de novo mutations, so there's only one affected individual, so there's no segregation, which is why we didn't recognize Mendelian segregation. And all of these mutations do the same thing. They all change the splicing of uh, exon 9 of Cullen 3 and uh, cause exon skipping, and which turns out to be an in-frame uh, skip. And so you get uh, a shorter protein uh, that uh, has this phenotypic effect. And if you knew nothing about the signals for splicing, you would have learned them all from these de novo mutations. You have mutations in the splice uh, acceptor, in the splice donor, in the branch point, uh, and in a an, ex an exonic splice enhancer uh, that uh, promotes splicing of these uh, weaker exons. So all of these mutations uh, do the same thing. Uh, and it turns out the second gene is Kelch-like 3, and we never figured out mutations in Kelch-like 3 by positional cloning because some of the families are autosomal recessive, some of them are autosomal dominant, and the recessive families have homozygous loss of function mutations anywhere in the, f in the protein, uh, and the dominant all cluster in this domain of the protein, uh, the Kelch-like domain, which is a six-bladed propeller uh, that is involved in substrate binding for this ubiquitin ligase, which ubiquitinates a bound substrate and targets it for uh, 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 degradation by the proteasome. So the question when we found these mutations was, what are the substrates for this uh, ubiquitin ligase and how do these turn into uh, uh, hypertension and hyperkalemia? And uh, Shigeru Shibata, a brilliant biochemist in the lab who is now a professor at the uh, University of Tokyo, figured out that the target is none other than the wink kinases, the other genes that are mutated in this disease. And uh, uh, the mutations in WINK4 that cause disease prevent binding to Kelch-like 3, and the mutations in Kelch-like 3 that cause disease prevent binding to WINK4, and there's now a crystal structure that Dario Alessi and colleagues determine that shows that the precise sites in WINK4 and Kelch-like 3 that are mutated are the sites of, that physically interact uh, between uh, WINK4 and uh, Kelch-like 3. And Shigeru has gone on to uh, uh, figure out the biochemical pathway uh, that this all lies in. And it turns out that Kelch-like 3's ability to bind to uh, Wnc uh, kinases is regulated by phosphorylation uh, in serine 433 within this binding domain. And in fact, serine 433 is the most frequently mutated site in patients uh, uh, with this disease. Uh, and so when this gets phosphorylated, the wink kinase levels go up, it promotes salt reabsorption, inhibits potassium secretion, and this phosphorylation is downstream of angiotensin II signaling uh, in the cell type in which uh, the sodium chloride co-transporter uh, is uh, expressed. So angiotensin II signaling promotes phosphorylation, leads to increased uh, uh, wink levels, that leads to increased uh, activity of the co-transporter, and uh, promotes promotes hypertension uh, and inhibits uh, potassium secretion. And uh, Shigeru has recently identified the phosphatase uh, that removes that phosphate group and uh, goes in the other direction. So the importance of this is we've known for 50 years that potassium has blood pressure lowering effects. And people have kind of ignored that. They've just said, well, can't quite figure out why that makes sense. But 
New England Journal of Medicine study uh, back in the 90s, there were a series of these in the New England Journal uh, promoting the DASH diet. And the DASH diet is a, a, a diet that uh, reduces blood pressure. And when you look at the nutrient levels in, this, uh, in the DASH diet, the major difference is a dramatic increase in the potassium load in the DASH diet. And Frank Sachs uh, in the School of Public Health at Harvard uh, has gone uh, uh, further than that and has shown that uh, uh, you can lower blood pressure by dietary intervention uh, by either reducing serum potassium, uh, by increasing dietary potassium levels or by reducing dietary sodium levels and that you get the, major ben the largest benefit when you do both. Uh, and this obviously uh, has important uh, potentially important public health uh, implications. Uh, hypertension is particularly uh, high in the African-American population in the US, uh, and there's a notable uh, uh, excess of dietary salt and a deficiency in dietary potassium uh, uh, that is, higher, is greater in the uh, African-American population than in others uh, in the US. I'll mention one last uh, uh, hypertensive uh, story, uh, which uh, I think is uh, interesting and will have impact. So it turns out that there are hormones, uh, there are tumors that make the steroid hormone aldosterone that tells the kidney to hang on to salt and water. So this turns out to, uh, these tumors turn out to be found in about five to 10% of patients with severe hypertension worldwide. Estimates are that there are about five to 10 million people worldwide who have these tumors. Most of them are never diagnosed or are diagnosed very late uh, uh, in their clinical course. We were interested in what is the biology of these tumors? What is it about these tumors that links growth of the tumor to the production of aldosterone? Are there simple mechanisms that mechanistically link uh, these two? Turns out that there are, and we didn't have to look very hard to find it. In fact, we had it solved the sequencing of the first four tumors, uh, where we sequenced tumor normal pairs uh, and uh, asked were there any somatic mutations that were shared among the different tumors. And it turns out these tumors are very quiet. They're only on average five or six somatic uh, protein altering mutations. And in the first four tumors that we sequenced from different patients, Two of them shared the identical somatic mutation in a potassium channel, KCNJ5. So this is the structure of KCNJ5. It's a typical potassium channel uh, in many respects. Uh, and as Rod McKinnon showed uh, in his Nobel Prize winning work at Rockefeller, uh, crystallizing the first uh, potassium channel, the gate for potassium, the pore for potassium, uh, is mediated by an invariant sequence of a glycine followed by a tyrosine followed by a glycine. And that uh, pr has the precise molecular configuration to strip water from potassium ions and allows potassium ions only to uh, traverse the channel pore. It's an exquisitely uh, uh, specific channel for potassium. Well, it turns out that these somatic mutations that cause uh, these aldosterone-producing tumors have uh, one of the, there are two mutations that are, account for now about 50% of all disease worldwide. One of these is at that gatekeeper glycine and changes that uh, residue from glycine uh, to arginine. And the second is at the position that abuts the tyrosine, which is the next amino acid down from the glycine. And that's at uh, uh, leucine 168. And we figured out that these mutations must be doing something to the channel pore specificity. And uh, uh, Uta Schall, who was involved in the electrophysiology, demonstrated that that's in fact the, uh, the case. That uh, compared to the wild type channels, these mutant channels are no longer specific for potassium. Uh, they also conduct sodium about as well as they conduct potassium. And so the inference becomes very uh, clear very quickly. The cells that normally make aldosterone are maintained at a hyperpolarized membrane potential. Uh, and uh, the signals that cause increased production of the rate limiting enzyme aldosterone synthase is depolarized of the cell membrane. And that occurs when angiotensin II binds, closes a potassium channel uh, that leads to depolarization activation of a voltage-gated calcium channel, and calcium is the proximate signal that causes increased aldosterone synthase activity. 
It also, at the right dose, causes cell proliferation, which makes a certain teleologic sense. If you're chronically demanding a lot of aldosterone, you might want to increase the cell mass that is uh, uh, producing the aldosterone. Uh, and so, as a consequence, this mutation in KCNJ5 causes constitutive increase in, in, in sodium entry, activates the uh, voltage-gated calcium channel, and that leads to constitutive production of aldosterone and uh, cell proliferation. So the contention is this single mutation is all you need in order to uh, get these tumors, and the proof that that is in fact the case so it turns out that there are rare patients who have inherited the same mutation uh, in a Mendelian fashion. And in these patients, every cell in the adrenal glomerulosa is trying to turn into a tumor. And by age five, all of these patients have adrenal glands that uh, are the size of baseballs as a consequence, and they all have absolutely rip-roaring hypertension that requires them to come to uh, surgery for, to remove their adrenal glands uh, at young ages because their hypertension is otherwise uh, uncontrollable. Uh, and uh, these mutations typic uh, typically are the identical mutations uh, seen in the tumors that, cause, uh, that, that are uh, in patients with aldosterone-producing adenomas. This is found worldwide. Uh, the frequency is uh, uh, of these two mutations uh, in uh, uh, Europe is uh, uh, about 50 percent uh, uh, are mutant, but there's an interesting genetic uh, uh, di uh, uh, gender dimorphism. Uh, it's found in only 20 percent of males with these tumors, but 60 percent of females with these tumors. We have no idea what explains uh, the difference uh, between the two. In uh, uh, people in Asia, the incidence is higher. It's more like 70% uh, of patients have one of these two mutations. Uh, and there is no gender dimorphism in the Asian population. And these are now in uh, large studies that have been done. It occurred to us that we ought to be able to uh, uh, do uh, good drug screens uh, for uh, drugs that might uh, inhibit the mutant channel, but not the wild type. And so we developed an assay to do that. If you turn these channels on in mammalian cells, you can rig it in a way that uh, turning on the expression of these mutant genes kills the cells. It doesn't kill wild type. So you look for, in a small molecule screen, look for small molecules that uh, uh, improves viability of the cells. And uh, we screened 60,000 uh, compounds for that. And it turns out that uh, macrolides, uh, which are commonly used uh, as antibiotics, uh, erythromycin is a member of the macrolide uh, family. Uh, there are several macrolides that are potent uh, and uh, highly selective inhibitors of the mutant channel that do not inhibit uh, the wild type channel. Uh, and uh, roxithromycin, clarithromycin, and then we've done structure function studies that identify uh, what are the critical elements uh, uh, for this, and we're on the route to uh, identifying uh, uh, small molecules that would be suitable for uh, human use, either as a diagnostic uh, or as a therapeutic. Uh, and it's quite remarkable uh, uh, to me that uh, these work as uh, well as they do, that they're able to distinguish between the mutant and the wild type channel. In the last few minutes, I'll turn to another area that I think is relevant to uh, thinking about uh, autism. Uh, and these are other congenital uh, disorders. And the one that we have studied the most is congenital heart disease. So congenital heart disease uh, affects about 1% of all live births. Uh, the severe cases uh, require uh, intervention in the first year of life uh, in order to survive. Many cases are sub sporadic, suggesting a role for de novo mutations. And so in collaboration with the Heart, Lung, and Blood Pediatric Cardiac uh, Genomics Consortium, uh, which includes uh, uh, Martina Bruckner at Yale, Cricket Seidman uh, uh, at uh, Harvard, Bruce Gelb uh, at uh, Mount Sinai, and Wendy Chung here at the, the Simons Foundation and also at Columbia, uh, we've collected more than 10,000 uh, uh, probands with severe congenital heart disease. Uh, 2,600 of these uh, parent offspring trios have been sequenced compared to Simon's uh, healthy control trios. Uh, and all of the cases are singletons without a family history. And uh, we've identified uh, de novo and transmitted mutations that contribute to disease. I'll just give uh, a couple examples. Uh, one of these was quite unexpected. We found 
a, a gross excess of homozygous uh, missense variants in a gene called GDF1 uh, that turns out to grossly violate Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. And when you see this as a geneticist, your first thought is there must be a founder mutation uh, that's causing this. And it turns out that all of these homozygotes are uh, Ashkenazi Jews that were recru recruited here in New York with severe congenital heart disease. Uh, and this, this single mutation accounts for about 5% of congenital heart disease among the Ashkenazim. The second mutation that uh, kind of jumped off the page these are QQ plots comparing the, uh, the expected and observed uh, frequency of, uh, in this case, loss of function mutations in every gene in the genome. One gene jumps out, and that's FLT4, which is a VEGF receptor. VEGF is famous as uh, being a receptor that uh, promotes, uh, when activated, promotes uh, uh, blood vessel growth. Uh, and loss of function mutations in FLT4 cause a classic uh, congenital heart disease, Tetralogy of Fallot. And the reason I bring it up is it's, it's an interesting uh, example genetically. Uh, so we have loss of function mutations throughout the gene that cause this phenotype of Tetralogy of Fallot. Interestingly, uh, many of the mutations are transmitted uh, with unaffected parents, so there's incomplete penetrance. But most interestingly, this disease, this gene has previously been implicated in a completely different phenotype, a defect in lymphatic development called Milroy disease. And the mutations in these patients are point mutations, missense mutations in the protein kinase domain that kill the protein kinase activity but leave the rest of the gene intact. And the fact that you get these dramatically different phenotypes from loss of heterozygous loss of function versus point mutations that knock out the kinase domain is quite remarkable. So in the case of, the con of congenital heart disease, uh, we have uh, uh, identified de novo mutations, uh, and these tend to occur in genes that uh, normally are not found in the population to have loss of function. They have what's called a high PLI score, meaning that uh, there are about 3,000 genes in the human genome that are grossly intolerant to uh, loss of function mutation meaning that uh, they impair reproductive fitness sufficiently severely that people who have these mutations never go on to reproduce and uh, have children. Uh, and these seem to be the genes that uh, are mutated most frequently and account for about 8% uh, of all kids. Similar to autism, about 8% of kids uh, with severe congenital heart disease will have de novo mutations as the underlying cause. The, the likelihood of uh, de novo mutation increases as you go from children who have isolated CHD with no other abnormalities to children who have uh, CHD plus another uh, extra cardiac uh, 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 manifestation or children who have neurodevelopmental outcomes such as uh, autism and children who have both. So if you go from isolated to kids who have CHD with neurodevelopmental abnormalities and extra cardiac defects, you go from about 3% of patients having a damaging de novo mutation uh, to about 23% having a damaging de novo mutation. So these kids uh, are quite likely to have uh, mutation as the underlying cause. And the genes that jump off the page as being the most frequently mutated that account for about a third of the genetic signal in, these, in this disease are chromatin modifiers. So this is, this is a nucleosome of the four histone proteins with DNA wrapped once around it. Uh, and uh, all DNA in uh, uh, mammalian chromosomes is uh, bound up in uh, these nucleosomes. Uh, and David Alice at Rockefeller and Mike Grunstein at UCLA just won the Lasker Award for their demonstration that covalent modification of these histone proteins is critical to developmental uh, gene regulation. And people debated this for a long time, but the human genetics is very clear that when you mutate these genes, you get profound effects on development in fruit flies, in uh, mouse, and in humans, including congenital heart disease. And so we have mutations that uh, affect the methylation uh, of H3 lysine, uh, histone 3 lysine 4, that affect the demethylation of histone 3 lysine 4, and affect the reading of that mark by a binding protein called CHD7. And I note that this is the most frequently mutated gene in congenital heart disease, and its relative, CHD8, uh, is perhaps the most frequently mutated gene uh, in children uh, with, uh, with autism, suggesting an interesting uh, underlying link 
And in fact, all of the genetics of autism has pointed to this same pathway being very important in the pathogenesis uh, of uh, autism. Uh, so this is uh, Samir Zaidi, who started the work uh, in the lab, uh, Jason Holmesy at Harvard, who has been a major contributor, uh, and uh, uh, Peter Jin, who is now leading the charge uh, in the laboratory and in the autism world. There have been many contributors, but uh, one of these is Matt State, who uh, trained in my lab, uh, and uh, I, he obviously has been uh, has gone on to do uh, great things in the autism uh, field, along with his uh, former student, Stefan Sanders. So interestingly, there are far more uh, overlaps of genes with loss of function mutations or damaging de novo mutations in autism and congenital heart disease. There's much greater overlap than expected by chance. And the reason I point this out is that frequently in the autism world, we talk about well, if we could only identify these children early enough, uh, we'd be able to, we might be able to intervene with uh, therapy uh, if we got to them uh, before they were too advanced with their autism. Well, this is an interesting opportunity because congenital heart disease, these children are identified the first <coughs> days of life because their plumbing is uh, so uh, uh, poor. Uh, and uh, in, in fact, with the children who have mutations in the chromatin pathway, uh, uh, about 90% of them end up uh, with autism or other neurodevelopmental abnormalities. And I, uh, I'm sure that Wendy Chung uh, is, uh, has been uh, involved in discussing, in discussing opportunities to pursue this uh, uh, kind of approach uh, here at Simons. I'll just close with uh, one uh, final example. You know, we talk a lot in human biology, uh, in human biology about Mendelian genetics and common variants with uh, small effect, and we behave as though those are two different worlds. And yet, and we wonder a lot about epistasis. Where are there interactions between genes that are not simply additive? And uh, we recently identified the first, I think, clear example of uh, epistasis in human uh, genetics uh, from combination of a rare variant with large effect and a common variant with very small effect. And so uh, uh, this is Andrew Timberlake, uh, an MD-PhD student uh, at Yale who recently finished up uh, and is now a resident here in New York City. Uh, and he studied craniosynostosis. So the nor normally at birth, the bones of our skull have not fused to allow the brain to expand, uh, doubles its volume in about one year. Uh, but if you have a mutation that causes a premature fusion of the bones of the skull, uh, you need surgical intervention uh, to uh, allow the, uh, the brain to grow normally. This happens uh, about one in 2,000 live births. 85% of patients are non-syndromic. Uh, and uh, Andrew set out to collect a cohort uh, of patients uh, to look for genes in non-syndromic disease, which was uh, unstudied at that time. And in six weeks, he recruited uh, the largest cohort in the world using social media. And we've now done this for about half a dozen projects. Uh, go to a support group uh, with an interesting rare disease that hasn't been explored, might be genetic, might have other causes. Uh, get, them, uh, get them to allow you to uh, post on the website. If you're interested in participating in a genetic study, contact us and uh, sign them up get a, a spit sample, uh, do an exome sequence, and that's what uh, Andrew has done and has studied now uh, 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 about 300 uh, parent offspring trios with non-syndromic craniosynostosis. And the first gene that jumped out at us is this gene SMAD6. This again is the QQ plot, the expected distribution, the observed, and it turns out that uh, about 13% uh, of patients have mutations in uh, this gene SMAD6. These are loss of function mutations. Uh, and strikingly, a small number of them are uh, de novo mutations, and the remainder are transmitted from completely healthy parents. So what explains the incomplete penetrance? Well, it turns out that there's a common variant found by genome-wide association study. There's only one that ha has a really significant effect, and we typed it, and it turns out that it explains going from penetrance of about 20% with a mutation in SMAD6 to penetrance of 100%. And as you follow the inheritance of these two uh, uh, loci through these families, 
If you inherit just one or the other, the likelihood of getting disease is small. You inherit both together, the likelihood of getting disease is uh, uh, essentially 100%. And this follows uh, uh, statistical criteria of linkage in these pedigrees, a lot score of about 10, uh, extremely strong evidence in favor of linkage, uh, it, which is an independent test that uh, this actually is uh, the mechanism of, uh, of this disease. And there's a beautiful example of gene-by-gene uh, -gene interaction, a rare variant with large effect, a common variant with small effect. And we think this is a likely explanation, not just for this disease, but uh, there are many others that we would like to look at this in. So uh, these two loci turn out to play a role in the same pathway. The common variant regulates BMP levels, BMP, bone morphogenetic protein. Never ignore the tip for a tip from the jockey. You've got a bone defect, that uh, bony overgrowth. Uh, SMAD6 plays a role in the same pathway, an inhibitor of uh, BMP uh, signaling. So if you have a mutation that knocks out uh, uh, inhibition that pr and the other that promotes uh, signaling, the net effect is uh, uh, increased differentiation of osteoblasts and formation of craniosynostosis. I'll simply end by saying uh, uh, at uh, my old uh, haunts at Yale, uh, we're still running a, a large uh, center for Mendelian genomics uh, across about 600 phenotypes. We've sequenced about 20,000 uh, uh, exomes. We've identified about 500 uh, uh, new uh, uh, disease loci, uh, either new genes or novel phenotypes uh, like uh, one that I described. Uh, I'll, I'll, I, I know, I, I hope it doesn't feel like I tried to show you all of them t this evening, uh, but I try, wanted to give you a flavor of uh, some of what we've been up to. I think uh, lessons learned, I'll simply cut to the chase and say, I think autism is exactly where hypertension was at a stage where we had identified the genes and didn't know the biology. I think prosecuting the biology, I, I think it's a fantastic uh, story. You've got a bunch of genes, you've got a, an, ex, an extreme phenotype. Understanding the link that goes from the genes to the biology, I think uh, is the, or, the next order of the day for uh, uh, advancing the understanding of the pathogenesis of autism. Having the genes, I think, is invaluable and I think the Simons Foundation has done an extraordinary job uh, in setting the table for what undoubtedly is going to come next. So I think I'll stop there, and thanks very much for your attention.